Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is David Rivas. I'm Senior Vice President of Systems and Services at DeRigetti. You can think of systems and services as uh, the product and engineering organizations that takes the QPUs you were hearing about this morning um, and brings them into a production level, high performance, uh, hybrid computing system. Uh, to be sure, uh, what you were hearing about this morning and what you're going to be hearing about later on this afternoon from the algorithms track is the sort of pointy, interesting end of quantum computing. This is where science meets engineering and hits innovation to produce something that has never really existed before in the world. That said, it takes a bit of classical compute, uh, no small amount of software, and some innov innovation into in intuition to actually build a production system for hybrid com computing. Um, that's true now. I expect that to be true pretty much for the lifetime of quantum computing. It is critically true in the era where we're building hybrid algorithms. What I want to talk about today is the business of building a production system for hybrid algorithms and then how you can engage with that platform to bring that quantum computing into your business. <clears throat> but first, I want to talk about two sort of basic concepts that kind of permeate the whole thing and will be part of the theme of the whole show. The first thing is really, what do we mean when we talk about quantum classical hybrid computing? And I mean this mostly from a systems perspective. On the one hand, what you can think of and what most people often do think of is you got a classical computer, you got a QPU, you kind of smash them together and what do you get, a, a Prius or something. That, that's, that's not the right uh, uh, analogy or metaphor here. Um, really what you want to think about is you want to think about a classical computer making use of a quantum processor to do something that the classical uh, computer can't really do very well. And we do this kind of over and over and over again. And this has impact in how we design the system. I'm going to double click a little bit more and look at the sort of business end of this. Um, at its heart, what that interaction looks like is a classical computer sending off a circuit for evaluation, getting the results, bringing it back in, and incorporating it into the classical computation that's continuing to take place. One more click. This is a schematic of a variational algorithm. You're going to be seeing real variational algorithms used all through this show. Um, this is meant only to sort of highlight a couple of things. The, the first is if you cut this thing in half, you look at the top, there's a bunch of code up there that really is sort of ceremonial about setting up the computation itself. The really important piece happens down in the, you know, the bottom half of that. You're looking at an inner loop that can run thousands to millions of times. And the operations that take place in that loop are kind of what I said. There's the business of setting up the algorithm. I mean, there's the business of sending the uh, circuit for execution, getting the result back, incorporating that into sometimes a very complicated classical calculation, uh, producing a result, and then sometimes producing uh, uh, circuit updates that then need to be sent through the circuit and the whole thing is run over and over again. It is this actual calculation uh, that's important and that represents what we think of when we think of classical hybrid quantum computing. The, the, the systems challenge here is to bring that set of resources, including the software, in proximity to the QPU. And the reason we care about proximity is we don't want that circuit evaluation return results uh, piece of this computation to in any way dominate, dominate the overall calculation. We want that to always be significantly faster than anything else that's going on here. So um, this idea is important enough uh, that, oh, that we give it a name. <clears throat> it's called, we, we call it, and just for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to call it the quantum kernel. When you think of the quantum kernel, what I want you to think about is the software that's necessary to be proximate to a QPU and the hardware that it takes to run that. I'm going to refer to sort of both of these things interchangeably as a quantum kernel. Okay, so that's in some sense the sort of first system problem that needs to be solved. The next thing we want to look at, we want to back out a little bit here, and we want to look at what a real quantum-enabled application looks like. When I talk about a quantum-enabled application, I mean not just the bit of software that's running a hybrid algorithm, but the entire thing that is bringing service to an end user. This is infrastructure software. This is classical, lots of, in some cases, classical scientific software, visualization software, managing users, managing data, uh, manipulating data. There's machine learning probably in all of this. It's really quite a lot of both hardware and software that needs to be uh, put together to build out a system like this. But the key point is that most of that software doesn't need to be anywhere near a QPU. The trick from a systems perspective is how do we take that quantum kernel, or in some cases many quantum kernels out, bring it close to a QPU and provide the, for the necessary communications between these two pieces. So with these two ideas, the notion of a quantum kernel, and then the business 
of a quantum-enabled application. I'm going to take you through the evolution of the platform, uh, the Rigetti platform. Um, the first problem that we had to solve was how do we provide people with just sort of general access to a piece of quantum hardware. So the idea is, is that they've never actually touched quantum hardware before. Most people hadn't touched quantum hardware before. What they needed to do was they needed to get familiar with the systems necessary to write the applications and then start to experiment with actually running them on hardware. So what we did to solve this problem was we did well what any sort of uh, startup would do at this day and age is we put the internet between these two pieces of, of hardware which actually solved the problem that we were trying to solve. It made it possible for people to have access to a, quantum, a bit of quantum hardware, um, to integrate it into their workflows, to understand what the development environments were beginning to look like. <clears throat> However, we, of course, quickly became aware, both our customers and ourselves, that this didn't really solve the quantum kernel problem. If you've got the internet between two pieces of hardware, you quickly learn that not only are the latencies unpredictable, but they tend to be very long. And if you put a big queue in front of it as well, it, the whole thing gets worse. So the next step in the journey was, how do we solve the problem of just general quantum algorithm, hybrid algorithm development? And you know, it's not going to be any surprise that the first order of business was, how do we provide that classical resource proximate to a QPU that we can then make available uh, to a world that wants to have access to this? So we made a choice. We chose to take a model of putting essentially a full computer in the sky, in the sky next to a QPU, that any user would have total control over. Uh, we used virtual machine technology for you cloud aficionados in there. The, the web is built essentially on virtual machine technology at this point. Um, we, we called it the QMI for quantum machine image. My apologies, there's not an image anywhere in any of this. Change the eye to instance and it starts to feel a whole lot like uh, the, the virtual machine that this thing actually is. Um, this actually solved the problem of the, of the resource we need. The next thing we needed to do is we needed to build out the systems infrastructure necessary to do much of what you saw in that schematic of an application. So this is the business of doing compiles, getting binaries, submitting the circuit for execution, getting all back, reserving time on the, on the quantum processor. The next thing we added to that was a resource API, which is the API that allows you to actually control those uh, classical resources. You want to turn it on, you want to turn it off, you need to reset it, start over, that kind of stuff. All that's made available, as you would expect, through a web interface. Um, and we now have a working system for the most part. There's a couple of pieces that are missing. One is you need to have access, the developer needs access to the actual classical resource itself. We took the, again, we took the sort of natural approach. We figured that developers would be familiar with the Linux command line, might as well make this whole thing look like a Linux computer to anybody who's developing on it, and let's make it secure in the process. So we added an SSH connection, which allows you to log in from your laptop, and boom, you've got a Linux problem. Fortunately, we did something else. We added a, a Jupyter uh, environment that always came up with the QMI. This meant that after you've got your QMI up and running, you could use the familiar Jupyter Notebook interface like an IDE to do your algorithm development. This proved to be a hit, as it turned out. Most of the folks that were coming to the platform were less interested in things like Linux command lines and where do SSH keys go and how does all of this stuff fit together and much more interested in just getting work done in a familiar environment. We kind of doubled down uh, a few months ago on the Jupyter environment. We upgraded it to Jupyter Lab. We got rid of the requirement to add SSH keys. And so now, if you become a part of the system, if you, if you become a, a user of the system, within a small number of minutes, you can be actually typing code into a Jupyter notebook and then beginning to access a quantum processor. Um, this actually did a pretty good job of hitting all the major notes for quantum algorithm development. You have the proximate QPU, you have the a collection of tools that are somewhat familiar, or in some cases really familiar to the developer community, and you have the ability to control them all. But it didn't really touch on the business of how do you integrate this kind of a thing into a quantum-enabled application. Um, so we started getting a list of things that were necessary to do this, actually. It's a bit about configuring the software that actually resides on your uh, classical resource. There's a collection of things associated with storage. There's a necessity for sort of controlled and featureful network access. These are sort of table stakes for building a modern application today. Um, there's one thing I also want to talk about here, and that is that the, the, what, when we were solving the problem originally of providing access to the QPU, we made a pretty revolutionary step for the industry, and that was we gave you exclusive access to a QPU. We gave you scheduled exclusive access to a QPU. This isn't a queue anymore. This is you can, lo you can log in, make a reservation for the system, 
Tell, people, tell the system how long you want to use it for and set it up. And now, in front of your Jupyter Notebook or with your Linux kernel, you can interact and you can truly interact with a, a QPU. That, that's not the case with, with most, it was not the case with any system at this point when we introduced this. It's not really the case for systems now. Um, that said, there are some issues associated with that. If you're running an environment where you have lots of circuits that need to get run for your customers, you don't know when they're coming in, you don't know how long they're going to take. And by the way, the how long they're going to take problem is an unsolved problem in the, in the pure classical sense. This is the halting problem. You, you can't know how long certain applications are going to take. So even though this was a great advance, it still has some issues when it comes to integrating with the, with the rest of a quantum-enabled application. What we found uh, with respect to the first set of issues really was that the virtual machine was a great piece of technology to get us started, but everybody's building their applications in these lightweight um, rep representation of computation called containers. And so the message that we got back from a lot of our customers were, this is great, but we need containers, and we want to integrate containers in with uh, the rest of our environment. So let's take a look at the changes that we might make to the existing system to support this kind of quantum-enabled application integration. Uh, the first thing we think about is let's move the, VM, uh, the QMI to the side for a minute. It's not that it's going to go away, but let's start looking at other ways to do this. And of course, uh, it's not going to be a surprise based on what I've said so far that we're going to replace all of that with a container-based environment, but not just replacing it with Docker containers, replacing it with a thoughtful environment that satisfies the needs of the, the particular problem to hand. And those include, yes, a place to specify containers, uh, configure them with how much memory you need, how many virtual CPUs you need, and those kinds of things, but also specify storage that's durable beyond the lifetime of that container. And then in particularly specify, in a highly configurable way, network access so that the quantum-enabled application can talk back. Um, Turns out that, that uh, one of the really nice things of this particular move is that the rest of the system doesn't actually have to change so much. The system API stays essentially the same. Uh, the resource API needs to be grown a bit to be able to handle the new kinds of resources that we're now providing you. But from a, a structural perspective, this is pretty much what, uh, what we've been doing all along, which is, which is nice. We haven't forgot about the application and the algorithm developers. What we've done is we've separated the computation that takes place from those quantum kernel computational units and just kind of given its own environment. For those of you that are familiar with the Jupyter um, environment, you'll recognize Jupyter Hub. This is a way of managing interaction with Jupyter containers. The good thing about all of this is that as, uh, as an algorithm developer, you don't have to concern yourself with how resources are being allocated. You don't have to concern yourself with the system APIs or any of that. You really just fire this thing up and you start typing code. There's still a question about getting access to the QPU, but I'll come to that in a moment. Um, we haven't gotten rid of uh, the web interface. That's still necessary uh, and isn't going to go anywhere. Um, for the most part, this is actually a pretty good system for doing not only algorithm development, but integrating with quantum-enabled machines. The thing that I haven't talked about yet is a change to the system that allows for queued and or batch access to the QPU itself. So coming down the pike is a modification that will allow for priority queued based access to the system and then batch execution of applications. We think this goes the sort of right distance and if done right with priority queues provides a nice balance between complete ownership of the QPU at all times to you know, complete batch or complete queued access. And this is really the, the first important steps to what you might call uh, an integrated operating system for QPUs and hybrid uh, computation. Now with this kind of environment, we really do think we've hit all of the, the notes that are necessary to support algorithm development. I'm not going to go through all of these uh, things here, but it, it really is related to the weaknesses that I described before. Maybe mostly to the point here is this is about integrating quantum development with traditional application development. <clears throat> There's one other bit of technology that I want to talk about um, before we move on. Um, the software development kit is that set of software resources that are necessary for any application developer to integrate their application into a quantum environment. Um, what what uh, I've been talking about so far has implicitly implied the software development kit sort of all over the place. And what I want to do now is walk through a couple of things. The first is the basic system components here, and then the way that a developer gets actually access to these. 
Um, the, the top two things I'm not going to go into much detail about. Robert Smith, who wrote the original Quill spec and was one of the primary developers on Quill C, will be talking after me, and I have a feeling we'll be going into some detail associated with that. The one point I want to make about Quill C, though, uh, sorry, the one point I want to make about Quilt before we move on, though, is it's a pretty rational thought to think of our QPUs, at least from a logical system level, as machines that run, that execute Quill programs. If, if from a, a developer model view, you can't go too far wrong in terms of understanding our machines in that way. Um, the compiler is a necessary component of the system. Uh, people often don't sort of understand or, or see how critical this is. Um, it does two really important things right up front. The first thing it does is it takes a Quill program, which can be made of arbitrary gates running on an arbitrary topology, and it turns it into a program that is running on the native gates of our QPU, so that subset of gates that is complete but, will act, but are actually uh, resident on our QPU, and manages it to the topology of that QPU. It does a whole lot more, and I think Robert's actually going to go into some very specific examples uh, about that. But these two important and critical things, uh, you, you can't have a system without them. Um, the rest of the componentry there isn't provided as either particular pieces of software, they're provided more as services. For those of you sort of familiar with quantum computation, you can think of these as REST services that your application has access to. The first thing creates a binary, so an executable binary. This is the machine code that our control system uses to execute an actual application. And then the next two are services that allow for the execution of the circuit and then making sure the results comes back to the application. Uh, the good news of all of this is that as a developer, you don't actually have to know anything about the details of all of this. This is all abstracted in some kind of an SDK language binding. The one that most people are familiar with with, uh, with our environment is, is part of Forest. It's PyQuil. Uh, we chose Python in the very earliest days because it is not only a ubiquitous language, but it's a language that is essentially all scientists and most of the development community already knew. So by providing a collection of Python modules we call PyQuil to have access to all of the system layer functionality, it was a pretty easy on-ramp for people to begin to develop applications. Uh, that said, we're at the very beginning of all of this. We have no reason to believe that we've found the end-all and be-all, or that there will be an end-all and be-all in terms of uh, quantum programming languages. We feel very strongly that it will be critical to our future and the future of the industry that whatever development environment becomes popular or that you want to use should be supported by a Rigetti processor. To that end, uh, to that end I want to talk about two things um, that we've done recently. The first is that as of a few weeks ago, the Quill compiler now accepts CASM as input. That means any of the tools that you may already be using um, that produce CASM naturally now fit into this environment in a pretty seamless way. Seamless is a little strong, but it's, it's getting there. Um, the second thing I want to talk about is the C API. So in the same way that we provided bindings in Python to all of the system functionality, we've made a determination to provide those same bindings and, and even more actually in through a C API. There, there's two obvious reasons to do this. Uh, the first one is that most of the HPC computing world run on C or C++. It's either that or Fortran. Um, and so C is a natural choice. It turns out the Fortran reference makes C also a natural choice. Um, almost any language you could imagine, Fortran certainly, but almost any language you can imagine already has the capability to incorporate a C library into it and allow an application written in that language to take advantage of that. that. So for us, for us what that means is we provided the on-ramp for any programming language that we can imagine to begin to take part in the, the Rigetti universe. Uh, the one last sort of programming kind of concept I want to introduce is also going to be talked in depth, uh, at, in depth by Robert later on, and, and that is pulse level control. Um, since Robert's going to go into this, I'm not going to do much in the way of a description, but I want to say one thing about it. Pulse level control through an extension to the Quill language will be supported in all of the environments. It will certainly be supported by the system. We will, we will support it in PyQuil, and of course the C bindings will support this as well. The, the basic idea is that you should be, if you have access and desire uh, to use pulse level control, then the system will not be getting in your way. Two other comments uh, I'd like to make about the SDK. There's a command, a fairly robust command line interface for the system administrators of the world and the people who actually build these systems. This is a pretty valuable thing to have when it comes to scripting and all the rest, and there are people out there who actually like command lines, as it turns out. Uh, the other thing I want to mention is that uh, we have a fairly high-performance simulator. This is the QVM. 
Um, two things I want to say about that. First is there's a, there's a fairly robust set of tools to model noise in this simulator. Importantly, that tooling includes the ability to model our QPU noise um, um, to, to provide access to that. Um, the second thing I want to say is it's deeply integrated with the language environment. And this is important because we believe that for most modern workflows, development takes place first on a simulator and then live with the QPU. And so we want to make it easy, in fact, trivial to write your applications, have them use something like the QVM, and then with a minimal amount of change, truly minimal amount of change, run flawlessly on a, a live QPU. All right, so the last thing I want to talk about is how uh, our customers, how you, interact with us. And I'm going to start with what we call system integrator or distribution customers. When we come across a system integrator, what we do is we ask them two questions. The first question we ask is, do you have a data center, or maybe you have many data centers uh, throughout the world um, that you want to integrate QPUs with? The, the second question we ask them, and it's really two extra questions, is we ask them, well, can you get uh, us uh, connected to your data center with uh, a really low level of latency. And, and by low level of latency, what I really mean is about single digit milliseconds latency. So this is really fast. If the answer is no, then the next question we ask is, well, can you provide us with hardware that connects up to your data center, uses your control plane, um, but allows us, but, but we can pr provide in our uh, quantum data center? If the answer is yes to you know, one of those two questions, then we're in the business of putting that hardware, whether it's network connectivity hardware or it's the actual uh, QP or, uh, classical hardware, into the environment. We connect it up with the system API. We add the SDK to the environment. And through co-location, the system API and the SDK, we now have a QPU integrated into a data center's environment. The kind of customers that we're talking about here are large organizations that have lots of HPC, for example, um, as well as system providers like the Entanglement Institute, or the obvious case here is AWS. Um, what's nice about these kinds of customers is not only are they using QPUs for themselves, but they're providing them to their customers, which means our customers can often go to one of these companies, and if they need access to a QPU, and maybe they've built already their infrastructure on AWS, this is a natural place for them to get access to a rig eddy QPU with a minimum of sort of muss and fuss. But, but what happens if you don't have data centers? Or what happens if you don't have access or can't have access to AWS? What if, you know, God forbid you're running on the IBM cloud? Well, in that case, um, what, we, what you have is you have an environment, an application environment that already exists in some data center, a public data center, a private data center, a private cloud, whatever, um, and you need us to provide you with hardware running in our data center. And we do that essentially as I've described before. This is the container environment that I'm talking about. We give you a resource API to manage it. We give you a system API to connect up to a QPU. We sprinkle the SDK over this so that you can actually interact with it. And with a resource API, a system API, and the SDK, boom, you've got a QPU embedded in your application. Uh, we haven't forgot algorithm uh, development at all. It's essentially as you would expect. We keep the Jupyter Lab uh, environment. We separate it out from the rest of the technology so that it can actually be managed as a separate environment. Uh, the developer doesn't need to know anything really about the recess resource API or the system API, but they do know about the SDK, and that kind of an environment provides them exactly the kind of interactive use that they're looking for when they're doing actual algorithm development. So wh what I'm hoping you're taking away from all of this is that with a relatively few simple moving parts, we can meet you where you are and provide you access to what are becoming the world's most powerful computers. And with that, what I'd like to do is uh, invite Worley from Strangeworks up. Strangeworks has been doing an integration with this platform and is going to talk a little bit about some work they've done that speaks to some of the things that I've uh, been talking about so far. Here Thank you, go, you very 